last week uh, and this week, uh, we discussed, and we will be discussing, the many martyrs of the early church. There, there were uh, bishops, bishops in Antioch and Smyrna, a priest in North Africa, a teacher in Rome, a wife, Ignatius, Polycarp, Tertullian, Justin, uh, Perpetua, and, and others. These all died for the name of Christ. They all died uh, for being Christians. They all suffered for uh, being in the school of Jesus. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Martyrdom is, uh, I believe, a gift that God bestows onto uh, his children, that they, that they can die a good death. We live in a time of increasing hostility to Christianity, and we haven't yet reached the point of shedding blood, uh, and perhaps we will, but I actually don't believe that um, we will. I don't believe that Christians will be martyred in the same way. Um, I could be wrong on this, but I'm not convinced that God wants to give our unfaithful church the honor of dying for his name. Uh, I believe that we... Uh, will simply be oppressed, and perhaps brutally uh, oppressed. Um, like the Israelites under Midian, like the Israelites under Babylon, the Israelites being oppressed, being suppressed by Midian, were not martyrs, though some may have died. The Israelites taken into captivity by the Babylonians were not martyrs, though many died. They simply were not martyrs. They didn't go down in church history as martyrs. Even though, in a sense, they died for being God's people. They died for being unfaithful, not for being faithful. And so the church today wants to brace itself for faithful martyrdom, but what they should be bracing themselves is for the wrath of God on their unfaithfulness. This reminds us of our need to confess. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. <clears throat> so I, I only wanted to read that verse where Paul is saying that the, the gospel, the faith of those in Rome has been heard of throughout the whole world. And um, that kind of post-millennial language of the faith going out into the whole world um, was fulfilled. I mean, it, the, it shows the success of the gospel during this time, during this, this age of Catholic Christianity, that the entire known world at the time, the, the Roman world, was um, filled with uh, Catholics, with Christians, with followers of the way, um, and that they were unified together in their common confession, in the rule of faith, and um, as we talked about last week, um, we, I basically broke up the time into the, the, this time it was answering the Jewish question and the Gentile question. The Jewish question we see in scripture of what does it mean to now be a Jew, essentially, or what does it mean for the Gentiles to come into the covenant, stated differently, and uh, the apostles uh, gathered together along with elders at the Council of Jerusalem, and they declared that the Gentiles were not under the yoke of the, the ceremonial aspects of the law, but uh, that they were to abstain from sexual morality and uh, idolatries and, and things uh, uh, strangled with, um, with blood or something like this. I can't remember. But uh, even in, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he talks about those who have the faith of Abraham are truly Abraham's heirs. And uh, so that's the Jewish question. The Gentile question manifested in, in what to do with all of this philosophy that has brought us along. Similarly, the Jews have the law that was the tutor that brought them along. The Gentiles had the natural law, the natural world, which philosophers love to explore love to talk about. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, these men um, wanted to know God in a sense, and they um, got close in some instances. They acknowledged that the world was run by a creator, that there has to be this prime mover, as Aristotle would put it. Um, and 
So there, there are things in Greek philosophy which do approximate true reality because God has revealed himself through nature. And so the church at this time is also having to answer these questions. What can we bring along, essentially? And um, the way that that is answered uh, was with the authority of what the apostles had taught, which was taught to them from Jesus, and who they passed along to the churches who were led by bishops. And bishops, at this time, played a large role. Every city had a plurality of elders. Rome had a plurality of elders. Uh, Ephesus had a plurality of elders. Antioch, plurality of elders. And the lead elder was the bishop, the overseer of all the, all the elders, of the presbyters. And around the presbyters, you have deacons. And they would, they would, so the presbyters assist the bishop, the deacons assist the presbyters. And this threefold uh, ecclesiastical structure is what uh, the church, how, how the church organized itself for 1,500 years until the Reformation. And then you start to see fracturings and, and more Congregationalist type things and uh, uh, Presbyterian forms of government and things like this. But uh, very early on, you have this Episcopal form of government. And, uh, and so uh, th what that did, the bishops of these apostolic churches guarded the deposit of faith. They called it the rule of faith, which was passed on to them. And so that not only helped um, weed out the problems of the philosophy that was brought along, or wrong things about the philosophy, but the Gnostics uh, at the time, these were the, the, this was the other Gentile problem for the most part. Um, you, have, you have the Gnostics claiming to have this kind of esoteric knowledge, like uh, when Jesus would talk to his disciples privately and explain the meanings of some enigmatic parables, they believed that they had the true meanings of, uh, of Christian teaching, and they were really bizarre. They kind of looked like Mormon teachings, or they looked like uh, um, Scientology, where there's all of this weird cosmic stuff going on. Um, I could, I, I, I don't have it with you, with me, but the, the, it's just, it's weird cosmic, it's almost like new cosmic mythology. And um, that, I mean, that's one aspect of it. But then there's also aspects of, of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is not a unified school. There are lots of different, there were lots of different types of Gnostics, and most of the heretics had some kind of Gnostic uh, tendency. Um, involved and some of that also was what was influenced by Greek philosophy. Pretty much all the Gnostics, um, from what I can tell, believed that material was less than good. It was somehow um, bad or corrupted, and so um, they denied the the incarnation. They would deny that Jesus actually appeared in the flesh because flesh is bad and God cannot be uh, flesh. He could not be fully divine if he's a man. And so you even see this in scripture as well, that John describes those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh as antichrist. And this is most likely the docetics, the, the not, which would be a subset of Gnosticism. So this time period is dealing with all of these things. And um, the last thing involved would be, this is a time of martyrdom where there are outbreaks of persecution of, um, of Christians for uh, these first few centuries. And um, from what I can tell, there's not really a sustained, systematic um, persecution of Christians until actually right before the Edict uh, of Milan. And that's what I want to read right now, um, because in the Edict, we, we talked last week about... Um, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, the, our, this time period is AD 70 to AD 312 to 313. And so the, the book ends are the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, which would be the end of the era of law, and essentially the, the, the uh, starting point, even the starting point of the age of the church or the age of uh, uh, the reign of Christ would be with Christ's ascension and his outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
Um, and then you have this 40-year period between that and the destruction of Jerusalem, which is amazing because 40 years, they're so, that, that's jam-packed with symbolism in itself. It's the, it's the church in the desert in, in a way. And then you have the destruction of Jerusalem at the end of that 40-year period. Um, and so in some ways, it's the church entering the land. Entering, and, but instead of entering the land in Canaan, the church is entering the world. It's entering uh, the entire earth. And, uh, and like I said, you have these sporadic martyrdoms and persecutions. Um, and, then it, and then it ends with the Edict of Milan. And I just want to read the Edict of Milan Real quick. Okay. When we, Constantine and uh, Licinius, emperors, had a conference at Milan and conferred together with respect to the well-being and security of the commonwealth, it seemed to us that it was proper that the Christians and all others should have liberty to follow that manner of religion which to each one appeared best, so that God who is seated in heaven, might be benign and favorable to us and to everyone under our government. And, and so he's um, allow, it's not that Christianity becomes the official religion, but it, it allows Christians to be Christians without uh, state persecution, without the civil magistrate killing them. And it's even de defined here as saying, so that God may uh, be benign towards us, that, that the wrath of God wouldn't be upon our government. And uh, it goes on to actually say, it talks about buildings that were taken away from Christians. And Constantine says, give those buildings back to Christians. <laughs> so um, it's, it really is incredible to me. And I, I think that this is a, a huge mark of Anabaptists. I, I, Anabaptists are brothers and I love them. Um, but I really think that they are marked by a spirit of ingratitude insofar as they believe that Constantine was the fall of Christianity. In some ways, they're kind of, they're kind of like Mormons, where it's like the church just falls into apostasy. Like Mormons believe the church fell into apostasy as soon as the apostles died, and that the church doesn't come back until Joseph Smith shows up on the scene. And Anabaptists are kind of that way. It's like the church was only pure up until this time. And then, because there was persecution, which does have a purifying effect, and I'm not denying that once, once uh, Christianity became permissible, uh, yeah, there is a sense in which um, it can uh, attract the wrong kind of person. It can get, breed a kind of lukewarmness. That's true. But I think that that does not negate the incredible gratitude that we should have for uh, civil magistrates being in our favor, um, being uh, guardians and protectors of the kingdom, in a sense, allowing Christians to worship in freedom. And I guarantee you the Christians at the time were thrilled about this news. And so I think that, I think that there, there ought to be a robustly... Uh, room for gratitude in, um, for politicians who are, uh, favorable to Christians. And, um, for the Anabaptists, it's, it's evil to engage in politics. It's e the sword is evil, but for most of, most of Christianity, the sword, uh, has been redeemed, uh, not in the sense that the church advances by the sword, but that, uh, the institutions that are run by the sword that God administers his wrath through can also be redeemed and can be meek. Um, so uh, that is the end. And I was going to read that at the end, but I was afraid that I might forget it because um, I didn't put it in my notes. So I, I bring that up now. We ended last week talking about Ignatius, who was the lead elder, the lead pastor, uh, the bishop, the overseer of Antioch. And uh, we read about his traveling from Antioch to Rome and his sending letters out, again, dealing with 
the Judaizers dealing with the Gnostics, um, affirming the rule of the bishops, really giving, in my estimation, maybe too much uh, at, at the time. I guess this is how I this is how I reconcile a lot of his his things, his speakings, his uh, overabundance in, in praise and. Um, authority given to the bishops is that it was necessary at this time for the congregations to be this uh, submissive and obedient to their bishops. The bishops served a, a purpose now. Um, but the, the problem that we have now is people wanting to say that we render obedience to um, the Bishop of Rome or the lesbian bishops in the Episcopal Church, or people like Justin Welby, who allow for divorce and remarriage. And um, this, to, to, my, uh, to my mind, is the strength of Protestantism. And I would say it is, the, it is the ancient faith. It is that we adhere to the rule of faith in that apostolic authority is the most important. And so when we read the apostles, and then we read that, that bishops... Uh, 2,000 years later are um, not in agreement with the apostles, we have to side with the apostles. And um, so uh, he ends by uh, he ends with martyrdom. He ends by being martyred in Rome. Or if you remember, he sent letters to his friends who were in Rome who had uh, political connections. He says, do not use your political connections to free me because I, I want to die for the name. And he did. And uh, one, of his, one of his friends who came and visited him on his way was Polycarp. And Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna. And uh, he was uh, born around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And he died around uh, AD 155. So we're still in, we're in the second century here with his martyrdom. And he was very old when he was martyred. And... Um, uh, he was all, probably the, the, the thing that he's most known for is that he was a disciple of John. Um, John, who wrote uh, Revelation, um, who wrote the Gospel of John. Polycarp was his disciple, and Polycarp was a bishop. Uh, Polycarp uh, knew that he was going to be a martyr. Um, because he uh, had a vision uh, one day of uh, fire under his, he, I guess he was praying on his bed, and he had a vision of fire under his pillow, and he told his friends that he was going to be burnt alive, um, which we'll see kind of happened. Uh, the so, so when the soldiers come for Polycarp, he's, uh, he asks for an hour to pray, and uh, and they give him an hour, and he winds up praying for two hours. And some of the soldiers actually are ashamed that they came to arrest him because of his piety. That this man was so sincere in his faith. Um, and, he, and while they were there, Polycarp actually made food for them and fed them. <laughs> um, okay, so... Once he's actually in front of the proconsul, um, he's about ready to be martyred. Uh, the proconsul says to him this. He says, um, down with the atheists, and the atheists would be the Christians. Uh, down with the atheists, swear, reproach Christ, and I will set you free. And this is how Polycarp responds. He says, 86 years I have served him. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And uh, the proconsul responds. He says, I have wild animals here and I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Polycarp says, call them. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad, uh, though, to be changed from evil to righteousness. And then the proconsul says, well, if you despise the animals, I'll have you burned. And Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour, and it is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. 
Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. <laughs> so uh, Polycarp has this kind of spunk to him. He's, he's, um, he has the spirit of Elijah in the sense that he's taunting the powerlessness of, of this world, of these gods. And um, there's a fearlessness there. And the, the account that we're reading from, it says, uh, it was all done in the time it takes to tell. The crowd collected wood and bundles of sticks from the shops and public baths. The Jews, as usual, were keen to help. And so we have, a, we have here, uh, again, the struggle with our older brother, with the Jews, um, who, who had given up their inheritance, right, like Esau. And the Jews were, were like Esau, they want to kill Jacob. And, um, and, the, and we have this account here. We, the Jews were complicit all the way from the martyrdom of Steve, Stephen until now. We see that they are very interested in snuffing out their younger brother. They're very interested in killing Jacob and killing Israel and killing Christians. Uh, okay, so this is, now this is interesting. The account goes on to tell us that once they started the fire, that the fire formed an arch around him that it actually didn't it didn't touch him it surrounded his face surrounded his body and that his uh flesh didn't look like it was burning but it appeared to be gold and silver and that uh the smell that came wasn't the smell of of flesh but it was actually a pleasing aroma it was a fragrance it was sweet and that, um, and 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 everyone witnessed this, and and so since the fire wasn't killing him, one of the soldiers took a dagger and stabbed him, and uh, and pierced him. And uh, the the uh, the account that we read, it says the crowd was amazed at the differences between the unbelievers and the elect <laughs> who were killed, and I I think that that would be an amazing thing to witness. Uh, one other thing about Polycarp, and then we can move on to Justin Martyr. Uh, one thing that I think is, I found interesting is uh, there was an account of Polycarp running into Marcion, who we will talk about in a little bit. Um, Marcion is a heretic, and he was excommunicated. Um, and he runs into him in Rome, and uh, he ignores him, like a good Christian should do to someone who's excommunicated. Uh, because that's what Jesus tells us to do, right? Treat him like a tax collector or a Gentile. He, uh, he ignores him, and Marcion says to him, Mar that it really bothered him, and Marcion says, acknowledge me. And Polycarp replies by saying, I do acknowledge you. You are the firstborn of Satan. <laughs> and uh, that's another, it's another, it's just, it's amazing to witness, you know, bishops now or Christ Christians now who are so nice and uh, yes, we should speak with kindness and, and love and gentleness, but at the same time, uh, there are moments when uh, severity and, and harshness is called for. John Calvin uh, once said, and I think he says, and I think it's his institute, he says that the pastor should have two, voice, two voices, one for calling the sheep and another one for scaring away the wolves. And uh, that's something that we see with these early bishops, with these pastors, that they have the two voices, that they, you, you read the letters to the churches and they, 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 are, they are pastoral in the sense that they are affectionate and kind and warm and they love God's people. But then you see them and how they treat the wolves and they are mean <laughs> and they are stern and, and they are tough. Um, and that's something that we need to repent of as Christians now, that we only have one voice, that we, that we speak softly and sweetly to the wolves is, uh, is a sin um, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr lived about uh, 100 to 165. Another martyr. That's why he's called Martyr. His last name isn't Martyr, but uh, he was uh, martyred in Rome. He eventually wound up starting a, a Christian philosophy school in Rome, and he and some of his students were 
were martyred for being Christians. So his name's Justin, and uh, he was a Gentile professional philosopher and before he became a Christian. And I really love Justin because he, he was really one of the first to engage in a deep way with the broader Greco-Roman world uh, that Christianity was born into. He communicated to the culture. He understood it. And he engaged with them in a way um, that you don't really see with, uh, some, with these bishops. Uh, and Justin Martyr, wasn't, he wasn't clergy. He was just a lay person. He, he wasn't uh, a deacon or a priest or a bishop. But he was a teacher. And, and he, he wound up being a, a teacher uh, of, of, of Christianity or Christian philosophy. And uh, how he, he, he's dabbled in basically every kind of Greek school that you, could, that you can think of. Stoicism, uh, Aristotelianism, uh, uh, Pythagoras, Platonism. And um, he even says, so he really loved philosophy. He says in his dialogue with Trypho, who was a, a Jew, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. He says, truly the duty of philosophy is to investigate the deity. <laughs> so you see, even when he was a Gentile, he was interested in knowing about God. He wanted to investigate the deity. And his conversion comes about when he's on a beach and uh, this old man uh, comes up to him and they start talking. And basically, this older gentleman tells Justin that, uh, yes, philosophy seeks to know things and that's good, but the fullness of truth has to come by revelation from God and that that is revealed in Christ. And it was that moment that converted Justin. And so Justin becomes a Christian uh, from, that, from that point forward. He's, mo he's known for two apologies. Uh, he, his, he has a first apology and second apology. And um, he's writing in defense of Christian philosophy. The first one is written to the emperor. Second one is written to the Roman Senate, and the second one is more in defense of, of Christianity against uh, various accusations and persecutions at the time. And then he wrote an apology, uh, which is called the Dialogue with Trypho, and um, that's, that's interesting in, in itself uh, because, again, it goes back to the Jewish question. It's him talking with this Jew about uh, the role of uh, the Old Covenant scriptures, the role of the Mosaic Law, all of these things are um, discussed in his, in his dialogue with Trypho, which could be a literary device or it could have actually been a, an actual conversation that he had. Um, I'm inclined to believe that it, it was a real, a real conversation. And um, it's essentially, it's an apology, it's a defense that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Which is, this is, again, these are just the same things that, that the apostles were dealing with. And you see it uh, recapitulated again in, uh, in, in these various authors. Um, I, I have a whole long quote here from, from Justin on, on the liturgy, but I'm not going to read it. I've read it before, I think, in other times, but, but it's basically, <laughs> so he, he's writing around 155, about 10 years before his, his martyrdom, and he describes church on Sunday, <laughs> and he describes a liturgy, and um, it's basically what we do. It's basically what most... Uh, most liturgical churches do. You can look at what he does here, and it's one, they meet on Sunday. They don't meet on Saturday, so he's not a Seventh-day Adventist. They meet on Sunday. Uh, they gather together in one place. They read the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets, as long as time permits. And, uh, and then once the reader has ceased, uh, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to imitate those things. Then they rise and pray, and then they participate in the Eucharist. And, um, and people who are not baptized are not allowed to partake in the Eucharist. And uh, one of the interesting things about 
the Eucharist that, that Justin Martyr, and both Justin Martyr and Irenaeus talk about this, is that they believed that the Eucharist was a fulfillment of Malachi 1.11. And Malachi 1.11 reads, reads as follows. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And so they believed that this uh, offering, this pure offering, uh, was fulfilled in, in the Eucharist. Another thing that uh, Justin talks about is... Um, there's that the, there's typology in scripture, and this is another similarity with Irenaeus, which we'll talk about. Um, and I'll just go ahead. I'll go ahead and read this quote. Um, but he makes the comparison between Eve and Mary. He says, "For Eve, who was a virgin and undefiled, having conceived the word of the serpent, brought forth disobedience and death. But the virgin Mary received faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced the good tidings to her." that the spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the highest would overshadow her. Wherefore also the holy thing begotten of her is the son of God. And she replied, be it unto me according to your word. And by her has he been born to whom we have proved so many scriptures refer and by whom God destroys both the serpent and those angels and men who are like him, but, but works uh, deliverance from death to those who repent of their wickedness and believe upon him. And so he said he this is in his dialogue with Trypho. And, and so, again, he's using Jewish scriptures, uh, using the Torah and saying, look, all of these things point to Christ. And just as Eve was disobedient and brought death to the world, um, uh, Mary's obedience uh, was part of the reason that uh, life was brought to the world. So. He, uh, he's, he's one of the first ones to talk about this kind of typology. And of course, in both of those instances, the, uh, the uh, ultimate, the buck stopped with the first Adam. It was through Adam, ultimately, and then with, the, with Mary, it's through Jesus, ultimately. So Justin's eventually martyred, and uh, we have a contemporaneous account, and this is, this is what happens between the two. Between, uh, you have this Roman prefect, and he, he asks Justin if, uh, if he supposed that he would gain some kind of eternal reward for his martyrdom, and this is how Justin responds. He says, I do not suppose it, I know it, and I'm fully persuaded of it. And uh, so again, you have the spunk there with the, with the Christians. No, I don't suppose these things. I know them to be true. I have epistemic certainty uh, that it's going to happen. And then after that, he was tied to a pole and he was whipped mercilessly. And then they cut off his head. God giving somebody a, a good death. This is um, an, another thing he, you know, he loved, he loved Greek philosophy. He tried to seek certain kinds of synthesis with it, with Christianity, even though he, he, he would always say that Christianity, Christ is the fulfillment. Um, I think this is worth saying because I think it, it embodies his, his approach to these things. He says, whatever things were rightly said among all men are the property of Christians. <laughs> so in other words, all truth is God's truth. And uh, I think that that's something that we can, we can take with us uh, in, into, into the world that we find ourselves in, uh, that all truth is God's truth. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be uh, from, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a movie that was made explicitly by Christians or explicitly Christian books or anything like this. All truth is God's truth and ungodly men can speak true things. All right, so Irenaeus. Irenaeus is uh, born about uh, AD 130, died 202. So we're in the middle to the uh, end of the second century. Yeah. 
Irenaeus um, knew Polycarp. He grew up under Polycarp's teachings. So again, we have this close connection. Polycarp knew John. Polycarp was a disciple of John. John was a disciple of Jesus. Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. Uh, in Irenaeus, he, he, has, he has accounts of, of Polycarp, and um, he, it really exhibits the fact that he loved Polycarp. And Irenaeus' writings really seem to in, uh, indicate that he loved Justin Martyr. There's a lot of similarities uh, between, between the two. Um, Irenaeus means peace, and uh, Eusebius, a uh, later church historian, he, he writes that uh, Irenaeus um, really lived up to his name in that he was able to uh, win peace between uh, certain churches, different churches who were quarreling over things, particularly the Easter controversy, which I wasn't able to uh, look up, but I guess he had an Irenic uh, spirit to him. So he was appropriately named. Jerome says that he was martyred, but I, I guess we don't really know for sure if he was. Um, sometimes he's referred to as the father of Christian theology. And the reason why is because he's the first one to really uh, put forward a, um, a, a essentially um, a, dog, a systematic, uh, dogmatic exposition of uh, why Christians believe the things they believe and, uh, over against uh, false teachings, and uh, this is this is exhibited in his um, in his work against uh, the heresies, um, and the, the full title is actually the detection and overthrow of the pretended but false knowledge. So that that's the gnosis uh, thing again that he's calling, which is uh, it's actually a hunting metaphor, um, and it's you it's talking about. Uh, detecting, say you have a, a wild boar in a village and he's, he's uh, eating the crop and, and terrorizing the people. Uh, the hunting metaphor is you go out to where he lives, you detect where he is, you bring him out into the open and you kill him. And so his book, Against Heresies, or the full title, The Detection and Overthrow of the Pretended but False Knowledge, is a reference to this hunting metaphor. And that's what he's doing with the Gnostics. He says, okay, what do the Gnostics believe? And he talks about it, and then he explains why it's wrong. Um, and how does he do this? Again, he appeals to the authority of the apostolic churches. He appeals to what was taught by the apostles, what was taught by the bishops that the apostles had appointed, uh, and what was taught um, among them uh, had to align uh, with the Gnostics, and it didn't. And so he, he says that what they are teaching is is false because it deviates from what the apostolic churches and the apostolic uh, bishops had taught. Uh, one of, for example, one of the things that the apostolic churches taught was this idea of re recapitulation, which we kind of mentioned a little bit with uh, Eve and Mary, uh, and you see this with Adam and Jesus. Uh, Jesus is a second Adam, or you see it with Israel in Christ, that Christ is the fulfillment of uh, the Israel story, that, that Christ goes into the wilderness for 40 days, but he doesn't sin, he's faithful. Um, Christ saves his, uh, ch saves his bride, lays his life down for his bride, and unlike Adam, who, who tries to preserve his life and throws his wife under the bus. Um, and this comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam means that Jesus actually truly became a man, that he assumed humanity in order to redeem humanity, which flies in the face of Gnostic teaching, uh, which flies in the face of uh, a, the Gnostic belief that God um, cannot become flesh, that he cannot become uh, human. Uh, Irenaeus is, is, is one of the first writings that we have, so this would be late second century, which um, strongly indicate that pedo baptism was was the accepted um, practice at the time. He says this. He says uh, he, meaning Jesus, came to save all through himself. All I say, who through him are reborn in God. And when the patristics would use the term reborn or regeneration, 
it's almost always associated with baptism. Uh, so I, I, so he, Jesus, came to save all through, through himself. All I say, um, he, Jesus, came to save all through himself. All I say, who through him are reborn in God, infants and children and youths and old men. Therefore, he passed through every age, becoming an, in, an infant for infants, sanctifying infants, a, children, a child for children, sanctifying those who are of that age. So that he might be the perfect teacher in all things. Perfect not, not only in respect to the setting forth of truth. Perfect also in respect to relative age. Um, so that's, that's worth noting. Um, I'm trying to look at I'm trying to look at some of the some of the big things here. Um, we already talked about some of the similarities that he had with Justin Martyr. He believed that the Eucharist was a fulfillment of Malachi 1:11. Um, all right. Let's move on to Tertullian. Tertullian was uh, 155 to 240. And uh, so we're starting to get into the third century. He's the first Latin father. So everybody uh, prior to him is writing in, in Greek. Um, but he's the first Latin father that we have, which is what we're going to see uh, in the West. Um, so he's, he's in North Africa. He's in Carthage. Um, he's kind of a preliminary to... Uh, Augustine, some people think that they're, because after Tertullian, you have Cyprian of Carthage, and then you have Augustine, who is, is, is in Carthage as well. Um, but Tertullian is great. Tertullian, Tertullian was, uh, he's the embodiment of tough and rough, and um, he, was, he was like the, uh, John, the John Wayne of this time period which was a wild west of ideas and striving for authority and Tertullian he was cocky and he was mean and he wasn't afraid of a fight um, he was actually the son of a Roman centurion and so perhaps some of his grit comes uh, from that um, he then became a lawyer or some kind of legal uh, rhetorician which is called an advocate, and then he converts to Christianity, and he becomes a priest in Carthage, uh, or a presbyter. He's one of those guys who had the, the two voices that Calvin talks about, the, the voice for gathering the sheep and the voice for scaring away the wolves. And I say that, um, what an example of that is he wrote a treatise on Christian marriage, called To My Wife, and uh, if you read it, he just, he speaks glowingly and tenderly and soulfully about the goodness of marriage and its mutual edification and, and, and sanctification in the journey of uh, becoming like Christ. And it's amazing because the early church fathers are really often dismissed, especially by the reform types, for being overly ascetic and harsh um, and for downplaying the role of marriage. But if you read this, it appears that Tertullian himself is married, and he basically writes a love letter to his wife uh, about how great it is. <laughs> so they weren't all ascetics, and they didn't all downplay the role of marriage. Um, so Tertullian is, is a priest, uh, but he has the spirit of a warrior and a lover. He's a, he's a debated early church father because he did get himself into, he was sympathetic to the Montanist heresy, which was basically a charismatic movement um, that essentially uh, said that their prophecies were supplanting the prophecies of scripture. So it was like the Pentecostal movement on steroids 
and he started to um, be sympathetic to that movement. Um, and uh, he had he has some other things. He has he has he's the first one to use the term Trinity, but he um, has um, some strange notions about the Trinity. I mean, there are, like I said, this is a time where things are just being worked out. And, um, and so a lot of these guys believe some, some strange things uh, from time to time. Um, yeah, I guess he had some kind of, uh, it, he was something of a subordinationist where the Son and the Spirit were less than the Father in some ways. Um, okay. He, uh, he's also, I, I, I continue to bring up baptism. He's also the only church father that I, that I, I've discovered in this time period who resists infant baptism. He doesn't condemn it like, like say modern day Baptists do. Um, but he does say that it's preferable to delay baptism. And uh, so you can, you can look up that if you want. Um, but his disciple Cyprian was uh, totally fine, totally fine with uh, baptizing infants. His best work is called Prescriptions Against Heretics. And he's, again, attacking Gnostics. And... Um, this is the prescriptions against heretics is a is a Roman legal term, which is appropriate because it, it sounds like he was a lawyer before. And essentially, what it means is that if you are not the owner of property, and that property has a dispute over it, you cannot sue over that dispute. You have to be the property owner in order to sue over the dispute. And so, what he says to the Gnostics is that. You do not own the scriptures. And so you cannot, you do not own, you are not part of the apostolic tradition. Uh, you do not uh, have any kind of right in this domain. Therefore, all of your complaints, you don't even have a legal right to be here or to say anything. And uh, so it was kind of, it's kind of this shrewd way of saying that Gnostics have no authority to interject themselves into this apostolic tradition. Um, he would, he, he was, like I said, he was laconic and terse and he would get annoyed with the Gnostics because the Gnostics would incessantly quote Jesus's words, seek and you may find, and then they would bestow their esoteric knowledge of what Jesus really meant about things. And, um, and, the, and, and, the, and just bring about their endless speculations. And Tertullian says this of them. He says, my first principle is this. Christ laid down one definite system of truth, which the world must believe without qualification, and which we must seek precisely in order to believe it when we find it. And that, that may seem kind of like, yeah, of course that's true. But what he's doing is he's clamping down. He, and he's putting parameters around the gospel truth that was passed down to them and saying, this is what we believe and we cannot be so open-minded that our brains fall out or <laughs> Chesterton uses the analogy of we have a, we open our mouths. Like when we're eating, we open our mouth so we can close it around a spoonful of food and, and, you know, eat it. We don't uh, keep our mouths open forever. And that's kind of like what the Gnostics were doing at the time. So he's safeguarding the truths of Christ passed down to them through the apostles and the, the apostolic churches and, and the bishops. Um, his longest work is known as Against Marcion. And it's basically the first time that we have a verse-by-verse -verse biblical commentary. And uh, Marcion, I mentioned earlier that Polycarp snubbed him and he didn't really like that. Uh, Marcion was, uh, he was excommunicated by his father early on in life. And then he was brought back into the church in Rome because he gave a, a nice donation to them. Uh, but then he got excommunicated again after the leaders learned what he was doing. And uh, this is what he was doing. This is what Marcion taught. And you see this, this, uh, this tendency come up even now. He says that 
the God of the Old Testament was cruel and arbitrary and petty and warlike, and that the God of the New Testament, Jesus' Father, was loving and kind and forgiving, and that what Jesus did is he came into the world to announce this new God, this new Father, not the God of the Old Testament, but this new Father who was a really nice guy. And... Um, yeah, like I said before, this is this. I would say most evangelicals have this kind of creeping Marcionism, and the church universally said Marcion is wrong. Go away. <laughs> and uh, you know, Tertullian, uh, Tertullian, like I said, mean guy, in line with the sarcasm and wit of the prophets of old and the prophets. Uh, uh, to come, uh, like Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and others, he said he would say things like this uh, against Marcion. He said, "You may, I assure you, more easily find a man born without a heart and brains like Marcion himself than without a body like Marcion's Christ." So again, he's talking about the Gnostic tendency, which the, the Gnostics denied that Jesus had a real body, and he's saying Marcion denies that Jesus had a, had a body. I deny that Marcion has a heart or a brain. <laughs> so again, you see this, uh, you see this, uh, this toughness with the, the, uh, the Christians of the time. Um, I'll, I'll move qu quite a long, I'll, mo I'll move quickly here. Um, but Tertullian does use the term New Testament or Evangelical Testament in reference to what we would call the body of the New Testament at the time. Because this is a time where uh, it's not totally defined or you don't have these authoritative statements on it. Um, but the apostolic letters or letters that have apostolic authority attached to them are circulating throughout the world. And he refers to this body of letters as the New Testament. Um, Irenaeus also uses the term, um, but it's not, it's not totally clear that what, he's, what he's actually referring to. Um, and again, I said this before, but he's fighting the heretics. He's fighting these Gnostics uh, in the same way that Irenaeus did uh, and that Justin Martyr did and that Ignatius. He's appealing to uh, the apostles, the apostolic bishops, the creeds, the rule of faith in the apostolic writings. Um, I, I'll, I'll, and I'll, sum, I'll, summarize, um, I'll summarize that for you. He says, I lay it down as my first position that the Evangelical Testament has apostles for its authors to whom the Lord himself assigned this job of publishing the gospel. Of the apostles, John and Matthew, who were Jesus' disciples, first instilled faith into us. And the apostolic men, Luke and Mark, renewed it afterwards. These men all started with the same principles of faith, the one and only creator God and his Christ, who was born of the Virgin and came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Never mind if some variation occurs in the order of their narratives, provided that there is agreement in the essential matter of faith, in which there is disagreement with Marcion. So again, I'm, I'm just I'm nailing this home, the apostolic authority. Okay, one other aspect of, uh, of Tertullian that I really love, um, again, is uh, this, this goes back to the Jewish question is the, what do we do with the Old, Old Testament? What do we do with the, the Jewish Torah? Um, and Tertullian says, all of that is ours. All of those things are uh, the, the seeds of the plant which arose in Christ. So in some ways, Tertullian was a Calvinist in that he affirmed covenantal theology. We talked about covenantal theology a few weeks ago, in that covenantal theology affirms, strongly affirms the unified narrative of the Bible, and that's exactly what uh, Tertullian uh, was doing as well. Um, I, you, you acknowledge the differences, but you, but you really put your, your stamp of approval on its unification. And, in, and against Marcion, he says this, he says, a separation achieved through reshaping, through amplification, through progress, just like the fruit is distinct from its seed, although fruit comes out of seed, so also the gospel is separated from the law because it advances from out of the law, something other than the law, but not alien to it, different though not opposed. 
So again, he's seeking to claim the law, to claim the Jewish tradition as ours. Um, we talked about Justin Martyr really loving Greek philosophy and really, you know, his whole life endeavor was essentially saying that, that Christ was the fulfillment of Greek philosophy. Tertullian was not this way. Tertullian, as we said, uh, he was, he, because he was gruff, because he was protecting the core of Christianity, he did not like Greek philosophy because he saw it as a conduit by which Gnosticism and all these endless speculations could um, infiltrate. And he famously asks, uh, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? <laughs> and, and to which I think Justin, I think Justin's answer answers that well. He says, whatever men have spoken that is true is the property of Christians. Um, that's, I think that's the answer. Um, that there is, there is truth in Athens, and to the extent that it is true, it's actually of Jerusalem. <laughs> Tertullian's also famous for saying uh, that the blood of Christians is seed, that it's the seed of the church. Um, so, uh, as I said before, Tertullian may have been wrong about a few things, and I guess he, di I guess he died kind of uh, in isolation and actually, his death is um, his death came after being imprisoned and tortured while he was being imprisoned. And um, oh wait, no, 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 no. I think I think that's I think that's Origen. That's not Tertullian. Sorry. But uh, Tertullian, yeah, he he got involved with some things that were that were not totally orthodox, or that the church has retro has looked at, look you know twenty twenty Monday morning quarterback looked on as not not so right, um, but I believe that Tertullian was a great gift to the church. Uh, I mean, it was a time of intense heresy, and he was largely successful in squelching the Marcionism and the Gnosticism of his day. I mean, he, he finished writing in 212, and by that time, Marcionism is essentially defeated, and Gnosticism was on the decline, and it never really threatened the church in the same kind of significant way that it previously had. Um, and even though we still have these tendencies, there's still gurus out there who want to give you the, the true uh, meaning of scripture and, and bestow their esoteric knowledge or um, uh, evangelicals tend to have a Marcion, a Marcionite uh, view of scripture where, you know, that's Old Testament and you could just dismiss it. Um, those things were were beaten and destroyed, I would say that Tertullian was the death knell to those things. And he was, and that was his, that was uh, his gift to the church. That was the way God uh, decided to use him. Okay. So I mentioned Cyprian of Carthage. Um, uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into him. I'm just. I. I only brought him up because he follow. He's essentially uh, Tertullian's disciple, and he's. Uh, he does not um, shy away from infant baptism. Uh, I mentioned uh, Perpetua. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Perpetua. Perpetua. Uh, I'm. I'm just gonna skip by her really quickly. But I read. I read her martyrdom. Um, she, yeah, I don't think I put her on the outline, but, but she's worth looking up if you're interested in the martyrdom as aspect. She had, she had just had a child and the account of her death, um, I'm pretty sure kind of like Polycarp, she knew that she was going to die. She was given supernatural revelation beforehand and, um, and she was in prison and I think her father or maybe her husband uh, came and visited her and tried to talk her out of it because she had just had a child. And so this is a great example of, of, of giving up everything to follow Christ. And you see this, this heartfelt pleading from her father or her husband, I can't remember, and saying, you're going to leave a child behind. How could you do this? You're so mean. You're such a monster for doing this. 
and um, I, I think she may, she may have compared her husband or her father, whoever was pleading with her not to give herself up to martyrdom, in the vision that she has, I think she's ascending a ladder and that there's these monsters trying to stop her or some kind of beast to stop her from ascending. Uh, but in the account, it says that the crowd, the crowd was kind of um, ashamed because her and I think another woman who was with her were both lactating from their breasts because they had just given birth. And um, so they, they saw what they saw, the, 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 bar, the barbarism that they were um, uh, involved with. Um, Clement of Alexandria, uh, he's, I'm, I only mention him quickly because he is kind of like Justin Martyr in the sense that he's highly educated and he's well-versed in pagan philosophy and really wrote quite a bit on the interaction of Christianity and, and philosophy. Um, but I also men mention him because he, he affirms the indissolubility of marriage in his book called Stromata or uh, Miscellanies. Uh, and he was... Uh, he was the teacher of Origen, and Origen is the last guy on our list, I believe. Yeah. So we'll end, we'll end with talking about Origen. So Origen's in Alexandria as well, and uh, Origen's father was a martyr, and um, Origen also, like... Justin, and like his teacher Clement, was interested in this uh, synthesis of Greek philosophy and Christianity. But, uh, and that can be a dangerous thing, but he always kept the revelation of God and Christ as the preeminent, foundational, all-authoritative uh, thing. But the main thing that I would, I would, I would, um, take away from Origen is that he was very interested in allegorical interpretation of scripture. And from him, I think, I don't, I, I don't know if I can trace the genealogy, but he essentially had this fourfold way of interpreting scripture, which in the, in the middle ages, I believe was called the quadriga. And, uh, Essentially, you, inter you, you affirm that there's the literal aspect of it, that it historically happened, but that, that, that literal aspect teaches us an allegorical or typological aspect uh, which can tell us about Christ um, or, or something like this. Then there's a moral or tropological aspect which tells us how to live. And then uh, there is this eschatological um, or anagogical uh, aspect, uh, which has kind of, a, of, a, of an end times um, type of aspect to it as well. So, I mean, you see this, this isn't foreign to um, the apostles. Paul does it in Galatians 4. He says that Hera and Sarah are an allegory of the two covenants. And so, you know, Hagar representing the covenant at Sinai, Sarah representing the covenant of Christ, and um, so Origen was interested in doing this. Origen was interested in taking scripture and sucking out all of these other ways of viewing it, these allegorical, um, moral, and eschatological ways of interpreting. And um, like, for instance, he wrote, he, he wrote uh, commentaries on Leviticus. And when he's writing commentaries on Leviticus and the, the, the Levitical law saying, once you kill the animal, you have, to, you have to wash its entrails before you sacrifice it. He would say that washing of the inside of the animal represents baptism of the Christian, that, that even that we are, when we are baptized, our conscience and our, our inner man is clean, uh, is cleaned and purified. Um, so he, he, he was very interested in, in um, bringing out these things, uh, particularly in uh, the Old Testament. <clears throat> so uh, 
this allegorical way of interpreting scripture can be abused and you know protestants particularly are somewhat hesitant to enter into this realm but i think i think we i mean scripture in, itself invites us to do it jesus on the road to emmaus tells them that everything in scripture is pointing to him and um you know so it can be abused and particularly in in roman or eastern orthodox circles uh the, the allegorical stuff really does give rise to um, some strange doctrines, particularly around Mary. Um, so, I mean, for, for, I'll give you an example. Uh, so inside the Ark of the Covenant, you have what? You have the law. You have the Word. And uh, the Word became flesh, right? The Word was Jesus. But, the, but what, what the, the law was contained in was the Ark. And so in the ark was this holy thing and um, it killed people if someone accidentally touched it. And so what people will say was, well, uh, Mary is the ark in the new covenant because in her was the word. <laughs> the word was inside her. Jesus was inside her just as the word or Jesus was inside the ark. And so she's holy and we have to treat her with this kind of reverence. Um, I'm, I'm, perhaps I'm not uh, stating that correctly or accurately, and I'd, I'd welcome you know, correction on that. But I think that those are the kinds of things that really start to um, uh, accrue a kind of skewed way of viewing, of viewing things. Okay, another thing that I, I think that Origen gave us is um, he, he really believed that one needed to live a holy life in order to accurately interpret the Bible. And I think that that's a, that is an important part of interpretation. He would reference Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I think when we read that, uh, we think blessed are the pure in heart for they go to heaven. <laughs> that's how we read that. But Origen read that as blessed are the pure in heart for they will understand what God has said to us. <laughs> they shall see God. Godliness was required for, for true comprehension. And I think that that's, that's, a, good, uh, that's a good thing to, um, to affirm. And out of this, Origen, the, all of the criticisms of the early church fathers, Origen does um, embody. <laughs> he was highly ascetic. Um, he quit his job. He was a liberal arts teacher, quit his job. So he doesn't have a steady income. Uh, he sold his library and just lived off the meager income of his library, um, his library of non-Christian books. Um, and he, yeah, he just, he just quit to study the Bible and focus on Christian scholarship, basically. So he's, he uh, doesn't have a whole lot of money. He didn't sleep very much. He forced himself to sleep on the ground. He walked barefoot. He didn't drink alcohol, so he was a teetotaler. Um, he abstained from sex and even, I'm pretty sure it's Eusebius' account, he actually castrated himself. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, he really went the whole nine yards and, um, but later he actually regret, he, he explicitly, uh, says that he regretted, uh, castrating himself. I think that there is controversy around that. I, I, I don't remember. I just remember reading a long time ago that, this may be a story uh, re um, by Eusebius about Origen and not from Origen himself, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, okay, so I, yeah, I got this confused with Tertullian. But during the end of his life, there was another surge of Christian persecution, persecution and um, he, he was thrown into a Roman prison where they, they tortured him with fire and they also tortured him by stretching his body out. And so not only was he harsh on his body himself, once he was in prison, he was, uh, he was tortured and they were harsh on his body. And he died shortly after he was released from, from prison. So in some ways, he, he died as a martyr. And um, he acquired the name Adamantium after this, um, which means man of steel. So he was the... He was the, or made of steel, not man of steel, um, made of steel. But still, he, he was the first, uh, he was the first Superman in the sense that he was, he was tough. He was not a soft man. Um, uh, 
Again, I, I, I bring up stuff about the Eucharist and baptism because these are, these are big deals. These are things that Jesus has instituted. In Origen, um, he affirms infant baptism. And this is what he says about, about baptism. This is his, uh, from his homilies on Leviticus 8. He says, Every soul that is born into flesh is soiled by the filth of wickedness and sin. In the church, baptism is given for the remission of sins. And according to the usage of the church, baptism is given even to infants. If there were nothing in infants which required the remission of sins and nothing in them pertinent to forgiveness, the grace of baptism would seem superfluous. <clears throat> so in, in, I guess in some ways you could say that he's affirming original sin, depending on how you uh, define that. Um, but he, he's affir he is affirming infant baptism. His commentaries on Ro uh, Romans 5, he says this, The church received from the apostles the tradition of giving baptism even to infants. The apostles to whom were committed the secrets of the divine sacraments knew there are in every one innate strains of sin, which must be washed away through water and the spirit. So again, not a, uh, there's debates on what, what the doctrine of original sin is, and you can, and you, you know, you can nuance it, but he, he says that, that infants have, uh, these innate strains of sin, which need to be washed away through water and spirit, which is a reference to uh, uh, Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus, which evangelicals detach from baptism. They just make it entirely about spirit. Um, but even in that, even in John 3, I think after that conversation, I'm pretty sure they go baptizing people. <laughs> All right. So Origen, like Tertullian, has a conflicted legacy. Um, you know, it, it's this Wild West period of figuring out scriptures and understanding this God-man event and the resurrection that happened. And uh, some of his beliefs are not what we would consider uh, orthodox now. You know, he believed in some form of subordination of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, he didn't believe that our resurrected bodies would be physical um, and he believed that the fires of hell would purify all creatures to include Satan back to a state of obedience to God. So he was a universalist. Um, so not everything he said was, was totally on point. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with these views. These are, not, these are not crazy views. And I think it's actually arrogant to say that these, are, that these men were dumb or that these men were heretics. Um, they, I mean, if you don't have 2,000 years behind you to look at other men's mistakes um, and, then to, and then to harshly condemn these guys or to dismiss them, I think is, is, is foolishness. Um, these men loved God. They, they, they loved what Jesus had done for humanity. And they loved the story of Scripture in all of its glory. And they were constantly looking for Jesus in the Word and, and pulling out things that maybe sometimes wasn't even there. But I appreciate that instinct to find Jesus everywhere and to really love God. And, um, uh, and I also think that any kind, of, any kind of person who really is seeking God, um, and, and sometimes they find themselves in areas that have not been explored before. And so... They, they may actually be working on the edges of, of orthodoxy, um, but they, they're doing so in order to protect orthodoxy. And so I, I want to give Origen the last word here because uh, I think it's a good way to summarize the way that we should view all of these men uh, who loved God and, and, most, and many of them died for the faith. This is what he says. He says, as for myself, my wish to be uh, true... Or, as for myself, my wish is to be truly a man of the church, to be called by the name of Christ and not of any heretic, to have this name which is blessed all over the earth. I desire to be and to be called a Christian in my works as in my thoughts. <laughs> I think that's great. That's, his, that's in his commentary on Luke. And that's what I think we should do with all of these men. We should call them Christians. They are our brothers and uh, they, they were an, a tremendous gift to the church. Uh, despite uh, their their failings or their their um, uh, errors in, in teaching, they they are they were good men, and I am looking forward to seeing them in the resurrection. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> the world runs on sacrifice. Our 
systemic sinful institutions run on sacrifice. Abortion runs on sacrifice. Making the civil magistrate our God demands sacrifice. And we saw this with England's murder of Alfie Evans this past week. Um, I believe his name's Alfie Evans. I wasn't watching it very closely, but... Uh, there are wicked sacrifices and there are good sacrifices. The rest of the world sacrifices each other for the comforts of socialism, abortion, feminism, homosexuality, divorce and remarriage. Uh, all of these things kill and bring death. Death is inevitable. We are born with an innate and insatiable desire for things that bring death. And that desire will be met either in sin or in God. Both bring death, but only God's death brings life. And so we celebrate this meal with our risen Savior by offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving. That is what Eucharist means, after all. We give our sacrifice of thanks. We give our sacrifice of ourselves voluntarily for our King who gave himself for us. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.